Hello and welcome to Zookeeping 101. This is the Zookeeper podcast where we take you behind the scenes talking to professionals in the industry about their stories, words of wisdom and journey so far to get to where they are today, really showing you what it takes to be a zookeeper. All views throughout the podcast shared are of those speaking alone and in no way reflect the collections they work for. So please come along for the journey, enjoy the ride and thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to Zookeeping 101. My name's James Dennis, I'm your presenter, and today we're talking all about leaders within the industry, and I'm very happy for the first official episode of Zookeeping 101 to introduce Darren Beasley. Welcome, Darren, to the show. Hi, James. How you doing, mate? Really well, thank you. Now, if you want to introduce to all our lovely listeners exactly who you are, where you come from, and what position you hold. Yeah, of course, mate. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm Darren Beasley. I'm Head of Animal Operations at Longleat Enterprise, and obviously we're based down here in Wiltshire at Longleat Safari Park. And to be honest, I think I ought to start this little invite podcast by saying i'm one of the lucky guys james because i still love my job there's something you've said there so been at longleat for 35 years now and yeah most days pretty much okay you know absolutely if you still love your job you must be doing something very right longleat when you think about it supposedly the first drive through safari park outside of africa you know it's got a big draw that's 57 years under its belt i often think to myself why do i like it and i probably like it because since 1966 you know the animals have changed or the people have changed but it's still the same thing. You know, it's still lions in bluebells. That whole concept was right back then and changed hugely in respect of content and reasoning. But it's still the same. I could still leave my office now and I can open the window actually and hear lions calling and, and hyenas howling. And uh, that's pretty special, yeah? Oh, absolutely. You're a very lucky man to be exposed to that and live in the life that most people can only wish for. So, no, very, very cool. Now, Moving on then to your your journey, your career so far and, and the position you're in, you'll be very lucky to find someone just rolling into a role without building up to it beforehand. So do, do you have them, Darren? Do you have those stepping stones, those journey moments, those iconic moments throughout your career, which make you the person you are and, and put you in the position you're in today? Yeah, I, I think so. I think obviously, you know, I didn't come to Longleat fresh from school. I wish I was that young. <laughs> there was a there was a bit of before Longleat life. But I think that thing that most of us have as animal keepers, you've got to have that desire. And if you mix that with a bit of patience, probably a lot of patience and persistence. And obviously from a very young age, you know, I, I loved wildlife. I loved nature. I was a bit of a town boy. I wasn't, didn't live in a country, but I knew what I wanted and I wanted that phrase I wanted to be a zookeeper my earliest memories James four or five years old you make a wish you know if you throw a coin in a pond or a well or if you're on a holiday uh, rather gruesome to any vegetarians listening but we used to have the, the Christmas turkey and you pull the wishbone and you you probably don't do it it's such an old fashioned thing now but you make a wish my wish always secret was I want to be a zookeeper so that initial thing that a lot of us have from a very young age and then it's really I suppose being in the right place at the right time it's showing the right commitment and I think I was very lucky with my career path because I had a few opportunities that came along that I just seized uh, and I took right place right time and through that and I'd like to think fair bit of hard work you know your, your journey begins I was one of the very first people ever to do work experience it wasn't a thing when I was younger and we live fairly close to the now defunct Windsor Safari Park and my mum was uh, working at a school they did what we call outreach now so the the education office from Windsor rocked up at the school of course my dear old mum bless her lovely got a lot to thank her for said oh my son loves animals and he wants to do work experience and they said what the hell's that etc but I followed that through and then you know I got an invite to Windsor and I got an interview with the then curator and I got a work experience placement and talk about luck you know I gotta tell you just to age me that was in the early 80s Windsor historically was created by the smart family circus family a lot of big rough tough gang guys there and I think most of them I went in there as a little 12 year old 13 year old and they thought I was a jockey most of them because I'm a tiny little fella little baby face and some ribbon but yeah uh, cut my teeth there had a couple of mind-blown weeks and you know what it cemented it for me really did that was definitely the career I wanted uh, and they were very kind to me and there were people there back then that are still in the industry now you know they've moved on they've got older there some very kind people there I, I still know and I still know in the industry and I, I'm in a position where I'm perhaps you know up there with their equals now so that I guess really that was a lucky break and I always think what often ask you know how did you get started I suppose that was the first step it was that passion and that desire but it's also if I'd been a complete fool on my 
two weeks work experience from school when I went knocking on the door a couple of years later uh, they might have said oh no not him again clear off so I hope that I did myself some pride and even though I was a kid you know I, I listened I followed rules and I showed them that passion and desire and, and hard work ethic and interest to learn it's a shame James because I think Windsor's long gone now um, it's now a bean park as you know there are lots of collections and that have had lots of people that have got their footing and that you know the people are still here in the business and we're still working hard but those collections themselves have vanished and they're just in books and memories now uh, and I think it's quite important you know people like yourself you're an absolutely excellent keeper is that by even by doing this you're regenerating memories I'm here talking to you the memories that are coming back now the pictures in my head of my work experience at Windsor and then what happened after well it was like it was yesterday but of course 40 years ago you know so quite incredible I suppose you want to know what happened then really I think it's important to know that when I was getting ready to leave school um, I did apply to lots of zoos and I would have only been my birthday's in August so I would have left at 15 but uh, it would have been 16 by the time I, I started I did what I think think lots of people do i wrote to lots of animal collections you know there's no technology then that's proper pen and paper uh, stamps <laughs> and sent letters rather disappointingly back there that would have been 1984 i had two replies from about 18 letters i remember or somewhere around there there's my first lesson in life actually james is that since i've been in a position to respond and answer letters if they eventually reach my desk over the years I do try my best I absolutely try because little me there applying back uh, all those years ago you know look what they got <laughs> for their money if they'd answered and I'd like to think that uh, there's lots and lots of people out there that are on that same journey and a few you know manners are free but I, I had only a couple of answers back and the one disappointingly from Windsor was you know old enough come back in a year or, and go and do something and I should say the you know, the curator at the time was a chap called Francis Rendell. He pulled me into his office at the end of my work experience. And of course, my mum was there. Uh, and he said, don't go and work in a zoo straight away. Go away, get more experience, learn stuff. Doesn't matter what you do. But he said, if you imagine your career as a ladder, don't come in on rung one, rung, rung two, rung three. Because he said everybody's going to start at rung one and so you've got to stand out uh, and of course I was lucky because I did the work experience so that was obviously rung one already done and I took that so because I couldn't get a job in the in a zoo world I went to college for a year dear old Butch College of Agriculture a mixed course actually it was agriculture and estate maintenance would you believe that's what it was called back then but it was everything from sheep pigs cattle tractor driving to cutting hedges or uh, you know using machinery tools if I'm being very honest I didn't like it I really didn't like it. Not because it was farm life. It was a different culture. I didn't like the social side. I didn't like how far away it was to... I didn't like the classrooms. But I did knuckle down. I did it. And placement was on a, a local farm. And that's where the lessons really start. And I say this to everybody who's ever asked me. Experiences, uh, both good and bad, are what give you the life skills. You have to experience some dreadful things to know when the good things are. Just towards the end of that, God, contacted by Windsor and I was only just coming up to my 17th birthday and Francis said if you get your 17th birthday out of the way come for an interview and we might be able to find you a job we got a, a space so I did uh, left the farm uh, went to Windsor and had the interview and it is worth saying now and please I don't say this is the best advice I can give everybody I remember Francis sitting there and saying, I thought I'd gone to open a, a job for a baboon gate or something, you know, one of the, the starter jobs. And he said, Darren, can you swim? Yes. Right. I could swim about three foot, swam, swam like a, a brick. Um, I uh, wasn't very good at it. And he said, good, we got a vacancy in the sea world at the top of the hill. He said, with the cetaceans, well, he said killer whales and dolphins, he didn't use the word cetaceans then. I nearly popped. I, I don't know. I was so happy and so excited. And it was only when I got out and got back in my mum and dad's car, I thought, crikey, I can't swim. What have I just done? I'm going to drown in the first week of my job. I started August Bank Holiday that year. The week before that, I was at my uncle's who happened to have a, a house with a swimming pool in it. Very lucky. Oh my God, I, I learned to swim, <laughs> which is ridiculous. 17, learning to swim because I'd already lied to my future boss. But thankfully, that went well. So yeah joined Windsor and the journey had really got underway there. It's difficult looking back now. I said to you earlier about how exciting that time was and it was and looking back it looks like it was yesterday but it was a long time ago. I should say uh, James things are very different 
back then. So as I say, that was August 85. Joined uh, SeaWorld with, well, they had two killer whales then. They had Winnie, who's the original Nemo. Clacton Pier had collapsed and we had to look after Nemo. Uh, we had the dolphins that were breeding. Uh, we had the Patagonia sea lions, Californian sea lions. I accepted it completely and utterly openly because it was the right thing. I look back now and I feel a bit of a traitor because I think so many years on it probably wasn't right and perhaps that pool should have been bigger etc and at the time uh, Margaret Klonoska was doing a government inquiry into Dolphin area in the country the history massive great project um, for the government and that was my first experience of the amazing awesome world that is looking after incredible animals but also very much under the spotlight and you think when i started that august we were still getting the the dolphin to retrieve stuff which was litter and stuff out the pool but it was very much a commentary based on behaviors that were adjusted i remember smarty one of the male do- the main male dolphin he would push a piece of wood through the water and it's like a propeller and he'd make the noise for his blowhole and i look back now and i didn't think there was much wrong with that i thought that was great he's showing the no- noises he can make out his blowhole he can and push and direct. I think now if we try to do that with a prop and a gimmick, you know, you'd be cast out of town and, and bricks would be thrown at you. And also the fact that those species have developed and the understanding of them and, and the requirements and their living requirements, I think that's right and proper. And I would say, you know, looking back here now, it's 2023 now, we do care for animals different, not wholly and always totally better, by the way, you know, there's there's, there's improvements being made. But I think the understanding is there and that public perception I felt very proud to do a dolphin killer whale presentation in front of 2,000 people, getting them wet, talking about dangers, but speeds that animals can get to, jumping, splashing, dorsal fins. You know, I remember the commentary now, even talking to you now, you know, all kind of soccer. Um, I, could, I could probably do that now. That was right, because you were educating and engaging. And that's what I want. That's what I still love today. I love to see people loving animals, sharing that passion that we have, learning from them, having a memory, you know, that that life memory where you, you see your first dolphin or killer whale. And I wasn't at Windsor very long because what actually happened really bizarrely, Nemo the killer whale was very, very poorly. And my role, uh, which for everybody listening, you know, you've got to understand is I'd spend all morning, most mornings, picking up litter from under the seating. Uh, generally, you know, the more experienced keepers there, you know, were doing the pool work and, and the training, etc. But then I would do shows. I would help, you know. I'd be bitten by a sea lion several times. They're horrible creatures at that time. You know, they you'd seem to love my kneecaps uh, quite bad. But I'd do the shows and I would be part of that education team and that entertaining team and that thrill and that excitement of being close to the animals, you know, being in a pool with a killer whale. And I say uh, Nemo was quite poorly. What was happening is I was picking litter in the morning and then the owners of Nemo were coming and help treat him because we were trying to investigate what was wrong with him and at one point that was ditching the small pool having a massive great wooden gag if you imagine to try and feed this animal and I was involved in all that you know we we had a guy from Spain come across with a basically it was a submarine sonar kit for finding i believe finding damage in submarines we use that on the whale to try and find what was wrong with him quite incredible so even back then there was groundbreaking stuff going on but an opportunity came up while i was there in that uh, sort of first year and a half and i can almost hear people groan now but uh, to go and work with the paras <laughs> and do you know what i preferred that I absolutely, and I don't know why, perhaps it was the freedom, it was the the bond with the birds, the guy that was doing the parrots was a nice fella, he sort of taught me some of the ropes. Uh, early days there and certainly you know doing shows um, with the parrots back then and I enjoyed that the family that Nemo sort of was contracted to belong to was a a wonderful family called the Blooms very famous Uh, Reg Bloom is an absolute megastar in the zoo world Reg and Margaret were were just incredible people and their son Peter and and Anthony came out for the, the whale one day Peter said to me oh you know if ever you get fed up with doing parrots at Windsor give me a call like I keep saying you don't, you know, it's an opportunity. There, there's no such thing really as a missed opportunity. Decide to go left instead of right. It's just a different route, isn't it? You didn't do left, so don't worry about it. You know, if if you hit a challenge, if you're banging your head on a wall, so should I have stayed in SeaWorld and, and stayed with the sea lions and the, and the dolphins and the killer whale? Well, probably for my ego, yeah, 
oh, I'm a dolphin trainer and it's really amazing. And look how everybody loves me and these animals are incredible. And they are. I saw a dolphin get born in captivity. It was incredible, you know. But the ability and the freedom that I had with the birds, same bond, same caring, same husbandry, without perhaps so much spotlight, that was just a, a different journey, a different path. So I took that. I decided to leave Windsor and go and work for the Blooms. That really the path that I enjoyed the most. Um, the Blooms had shows all over the country, bird shows. I was looking after their full collection. They were based at Flamingo Land in Yorkshire. They had several shows and my job really was to keep the birds ticking over, uh, take them to, to somewhere, drop them off, hand them over to a presenter, go on, do the next one, then the next one. And then eventually all the birds are out. I stay somewhere. Usually a place called Pleasurewood Hills up in, in Suffolk and did the summer show there and then went round, picked all the birds up. Uh, at the end of the season and that's a seven day a week job you know there's no days off don't don't think that that was an easy life you know living in a caravan like some hobo I guess and remember I, you know I had a partner I had a dog I, I had my life but actually my life was working seven days a week for the birds they were everything and and the blooms were very, very kind they took me in as almost like part of their family uh Reg Peter Anthony they taught me stuff I just respect those lessons to this day you know the stuff that they taught me and the knowledge that those people had and Reg obviously his role as, as zoo directors and curators and oh, you know back in the 60s catching animals from Africa for the zoo world all these these things he was the action Jackson he he was you know uh, and his knowledge of how to care for birds and encourage birds to form and behave it's not everybody's cup of tea and and even now i can hear people thinking oh well, that's really mean and really cruel i wasn't brainwashed i could see the reaction i'm getting from the birds and how we got the the behaviors and and the engagement that that gave guests using all that physical prowess of the birds and showing off all their best bits I absolutely bloom and loved it. I really did. And the bit of the story there that I was going to say to you is one of the contract shows that the Blooms had was at Longleat. And uh, so I rocked up to Longleat March 87. Oh, it sounds cheesy now, really, but more or less fell in love with the place straight away. Tiny little bird show down in the old Pets Corner. I found uh, a friend to do the show. I think they'd done it the season previous uh, anyway, but I found a friend to do the show, went away came back at the end of the summer, mopped up the show, came back the next year to do it again, decided not to leave. <laughs> and I uh, I asked Reg if I could stay at Longlink. You know, looking back at that, I keep saying about opportunities taking the right paths. Longlink was a very special place. You know, the history of, of the Strife's Valley Park in Rum by Chipperfield family that had created it, the circus family. Um, and it was a 50-50 split between Lord Bath, was Henry Lord Bath back then, Jim Chipperfield family or Mary and, and the team. And when I went into Pet's Corner, it was a proper old zoo. You know, they still had baby chimpanzees in there, you know. They had grey kangaroos on a, a little concrete paddock thing, you know. And a lot of, a lot of your, your listeners to this may or may not remember there were lots of little zoos. Southampton Zoo, not a little zoo, but there were lots of zoos around that were like basically holding spots for for these big groups to, to put their animals i felt quite safe and comfortable but knowing that this has got a future here because i could change the world you know if i could just stick this out the the, the general manager at the time uh, which is mary chipfield's husband a guy called roger crawley lovely guy again huge knowledge massive great businessman we talked we talked to reg bloom and the bloom family and they said yeah we'll do our own show um, I borrowed some birds off the blooms. Talk about biting the hand that fed you, really. I was rather mean looking back now, but the blooms are so kind. And they helped me out. And I started the show. We developed some of our own birds. And at the same time, I took over what was then Pets Corner, uh, New Broom Street Clean, um, and started having the freedom to build my own little mini world, uh, how I've seen it, you know, all my life. And 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 as a kid, you know, Oh, I'm going to build a zoo. I mean, it's all done on computers and now and, and stuff. But back then it was, uh, I was working for a company that that was changing uh, and Longleat certainly was changing. Uh, it ended the relationship with the Chipperfields uh, in, in the early 90s. But by then we'd already, we'd already done so much. I was very lucky. The uh, head warden at the time, a uh, chap called Keith Harris, who's still a massive friend today, 
knew loads of people in the zoo world and by the way had come up through the ranks from, like me you know he went to agriculture college and was running the place really as the, the head warden managing all these animals uh, and basically doing the role that I, I do now but with him uh, he used to say come down to me and say we can work together we can have some fun on this and we'd build something we'd draw it and we'd say, will this work for our guests and animals? You know, is this good welfare? Is are are the are the animals right for this? And of course, we changed stuff. We we got rid of the the chimpanzees and the caging. Um, we got rid of uh, the the kangaroos on the concrete. And previous to me, I mean, I've got uh, I've got um, team members now that are still here working that were here long time before me, nearly 50 years, you know, Ian Turner's been here forever. And, and we've got several people here that have been that, that length of time. You know, they remember leopards in small cages and, and lions on leads and, and elephants walking around and stuff. And, 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 and as I said earlier about the cetaceans, that kind of was right back then. It was okay to do it. Nobody really questioned it. And we now realise, obviously, that there's a very different way to present and keep animals and, and their welfare comes first and that understanding has, has happened. I think we were at the start of that, uh, my time there at Longley early days. I'm not embarrassed to say that we had uh, some penguins living in with the Asian otters. And I thought it was really odd. You know, every time these penguins laid an egg, the otters come along and grabbed it and ate it. Of course they did. You know, that's what otters do just bizarre that you end up with these weird mixes of things so of course i probably wasn't the most popular person because i started changing things and i could see right from wrong and i could see growth better ways of doing it uh, and thankfully that journey and that path i was given permission to do it and you're judged on your results you know here's a commercial animal park you know this this safari park has got to have people coming in through the gate. And I'm talking loads because I'm now at Longleat. Look, there we are. That's my my career. Um, and really just growing and being in the right place. What an amazing journey you've had and some amazing stories. Thank you so much for sharing them. Now, looking back then, Darren, is there one trait, one attribute which has turned you into the person you are in today, but more importantly, got you into the position you're in today? I would suggest it would be persistence and don't give up. Don't set in stone too tight a remit of what you're expecting out of your life or your career. Around every corner, there is going to be a curveball. There is going to be a wall or a hurdle or something. But equally, around the next corner, there's going to be an opportunity. And I would suggest that if you say, oh, I want to look after ungulates and I'm going to work at this place. Well, I think that's the wrong thing to do. It's not bad to have a target as such, but don't make it your only one. Because if you don't achieve that, you're going to be very disappointed. And equally, if you are, if I can give advice to say you might be a brilliant ungulate keeper, but the three days you have to cover on carnivores because somebody's sick or whatever... And you suddenly go, oh, my goodness, these cats are amazing or uh, wolves are my thing or whatever. You don't know that till you try it. So don't label yourself too early on. Have a passion. You can be an entomologist. You can be an ecologist. You can be a, a marine biologist by all means. But actually, you don't know until you try it. My advice is understand that everyone is different. Don't set yourself too tight a, a target. Be flexible. And do everything. Pick the litter under the stands and do it day in, day out. Wash the pots. If you're washing the pots really well, you will stand out. If you're not washing the pots and you're leaving the sink dirty, the other keepers around you, you're going to absolutely give you a label. Have some self-pride. Do your best. If you do your best every day, nobody can ask you anymore. Absolutely. I feel with a good self-worth, along with a great work ethic, I couldn't agree with you more, Darren. It will set you fast. So some great words there. Now, Leading on to this next question for you, the industry can get chaotic. It can get on top of us at times. How have you found to pull it all together and propel yourself throughout the industry and, and turn it into a positive? Sometimes a job, certainly in the in the animal care industry, you receive outside pressures. All you want to do is to check that your, your tortoises have, have got the right food, the right heat, the right 
UV or whatever, and everything's hunky-dory. But actually, you can't do that because you've got to go and do another job, or you're covering for somebody else's mistakes, or, or you've got to mop up after someone. And for me, the higher I've gone up now, you know, head of animal operations is head of all the animal team here, you know, 114 people, wages, HR, health and safety, all that. Goodness, it can drain the living life out of you. It can be soul destroying. But actually what you've got to do is you're going to say, well, here's the good bits. Here's what I can do. I've got three days of grot now, but actually on day four, I get to do this and take time going shopping, paying the bills, you know, those things. You've got to give time for yourself. Otherwise, the job just become too much. And James, talking to you, you are the ultimate in koala keepers. You know, you dedicated, hardworking uh, man who, whatever challenge comes, you deliver. I could ask you to look up about octopus tomorrow and you would come back and i know that's the kind of person you are i admire that so the other thing i would say is have faith in yourself or yourselves so people can trust you because for me do i run longly no i don't run longly all the team out there working day in day out all the weathers they're running longly and I trust them. And if I trust them, that's what produces the result. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. A great team makes a great collection. And that's really what it's all about. Now, Darren, that links perfectly to the next question. And that is when you're employing, what is it that you look for in a zookeeper? I think if I was employing, I tend not to get interview stage or anything like that anymore now. But if I was looking and looking back at the team that I've managed to build over the years, I haven't always looked for 100% animal experience. I don't want necessarily the one trick pony the one person that can only do that they do it really really well i want the person that can turn their hat to everything you know i want the person that is trustable i use that word an awful lot dedicated will come in late on a sunday evening no matter what they had planned will when i ask them we've got to put barn owl nest boxes up or whatever because there's a storm and none of these good trees have gone and they're there they're there with their drill to hold the ladder you know so those people are the people that i think stand out the most and you got to remember as well the early advice that i got about starting higher up the rung of the ladder uh the higher up the, the rung the, the easier the journey as it were that is correct but actually that rung can be any gains in your life or your experience it can be that you show compassion or or commitment uh this job james it's never going to be a massively well-paid job there are certain venues that you can take but what it does do, it gives you rewards in so many other ways. So you recognize those people that are happy with those rewards, you know, spending time gazing at their animal, you know, clocks ticking, you've got a hundred million things to do, but taking time to check that their animal is eating correctly or moving or interacting, or if you're mixing animals, you know, it's taking that time to enjoy it. That's that's the important thing. For sure. Some really great advice there, Darren. And I'm sure our listeners are soaking it in. Now, this leads us to the big questions. As a part of the podcast, which allows us to tackle some of the bigger questions floating around the industry and hopefully finding a few answers along the way. Now, we'll chuck you number one and we'll see how we get on. Number one leads us to collection planning. It's something which everyone wants to be involved in. Everyone in your collection wants to be involved in getting their favourite animal in there through to simply being part of the progress of the future of your amazing collection. So the question I've got for you with this question is more importantly, what makes yours unique within the industry? And looking back, is there anything you would look to change if you had the option? Wow, now you're saving some tricky questions, Mr. Dennis. Okay, obviously, legal require a good collection plan. Yeah, Business White requires a good collection plan as well. I think the collection plan that we have now probably reflects more about looking forward than looking backwards. So uh, if I can explain that, having a collection plan is hinged on a lot of what you've already got. You know, you can't vanish animals. You can't suddenly have multi-million pound animal exhibits overnight. You know, it, it's it all does take planning, particularly as a long serving collection, uh, long the we, we have a fair bit of history uh, and our historical collection plan, our historical animals uh, with science and development are now turning around and it's what we've done in the past is now not what's going to happen in the future. We might be historically one of the best giraffe breeding collections on the planet, as in in captivity. Very, very proud of what we've done historically. But with a bit of DNA fingerprinting and a, and a bit of research, suddenly an animal that we were given many years ago as our breeding bull 
turns out to have some dodgy history and a couple of the females that were in here might have some dodgy history. So we now know that. So that collection plan needs to change to say, uh, don't breed those drafts. Stop breeding those drafts because that was all right up until three years ago, four years ago. Now it's not all right because we have new information. So I think the the collection plan going forward does look different, but you've got to have some historic loyalty. And by that, I mean, we are the Lions of Longney. This collection must have lions. Now, sadly for lions, what is happening is what was from an overproduced, overpopulated species, well, I call it African lion, and we had some, some Barbary, as you know, going way back, but the mutated what is now an African lion, oh my Lord, they're in a spot of bother, you know? So actually I can see going forward collections like us that have held lions historically for a long time, the focus is back on not just the Asians. This is going to be African Lion 101, correct gene pool, correct lion breeding, finding out where those those best lions to breed are and where's the best conditions to keep them in. And I hope that collections like us will come to the forefront of that. It's not fair to say our, our lions are mongrels because they're not. They're really not. But having a a non-genetic secure group of lions looks great when you drive past or when they're chasing the feed wagon or for our guests but actually we need to make sure that our collection plan identifies you will need to breed lions at some point you will need to hold this species uh, uh, going forward because they are going to become more under threat so i think that's probably the collection plan is we have historic loyalty that we we need to readdress and reevaluate. And I would say, James, actually, and, and I think you know this from, from recently, some of the changes that I've made in our own collection plan are not necessarily about content, because we have a business plan that we want to try and do, but it's about engagement with others. You know, it used to be very few people were engaged in the collection plan. Now, I'll ask anybody with a pulse, you know, you know, what's your input? If you might look after a, a koala or a sea lion or a, an aardvark, but actually, your view is hugely important. So we'll engage that and that will go, you'll report to your line managers, they'll report. And eventually we have a whole load of information. And it's really important that people understand with a collection plan, the word no has got to come in. And no, not because we're being mean, but because it's not either commercially viable. The conservation wish is not there. Recently, with the regional collection plans, uh, I think they're absolutely right and spot on. You, your focus is on certain species certain animals but we still have over 100 recent macaques here i can't phase them out overnight and i nor would i ever phase them out i don't think but what i should be doing is should that opportunity arise or should we need to what is going to happen in the future to our primates we hold the the non-breeding male gorillas the bachelor group here part for the uh, the breeding program vitally important does that mean i don't want breeding gorillas no i would love breeding gorillas here we all want breeding gorillas but until our non-breeders uh, are rehomed or gone somewhere else, that's not going to happen. We'll hold on to them. You know, it's a vital part of a good breeding program is not breeding. Getting the input from the gorilla keepers, getting input from the financial director or the commercial director or the marketing director, they're all important to be able to develop a really good, strong conservation-minded collection plan. Some cracking answers there, Darren. You'll be happy to know that's number one complete. We now move on to number two. We go all the way to the USA and a demographic survey done of their keeping teams. And more importantly, a demographic survey of the age checkouts, the time they're leaving the industry as a keeping unit. Now, it roughly is coming in around the early 30s, and that's something replicated over here in the UK, roughly. Now, that could be to a whole host of things. In the early 30s, you maybe start thinking about family, if you start thinking about money, mortgages, and over in the UK, we are considered labour over a trade. So the question alongside all of this is, do you ever see anything changing? And is there any way we can safeguard the future of our quite amazing workforce? It's the question that is always asked the most, and I think everybody always knows the answer, but it's not an answer that we ever want to accept. And I think basically to summarise it, for every one animal care job I will put out, I will get 20, 30, 40 applicants, perhaps. So actually, you guys are pricing yourselves out because there is a, a glut in the market of people applying for these roles. That obviously has changed over the last few years. You know, with, with the living wage and with everything else coming in, that has forced uh, collections to relook at this and, and, and raise that, that level. 
but also with increased skill set and responsibility and the pressures of the job. I, I said earlier, when I started way, way back at, at Windsor back in 1985, very different. You know, you you definitely could have come off the street for some of those jobs. But now the understanding, the level of welfare and, and conservation and education engagement, it's way higher. So actually, that should come with a merit of a price and a cost. That skill base that you have should take you further along in your career. Um, and sadly, with the wages, when you get to the top, and there's this little merry-go-round that I, that happens, and I'm thankful that I'm not in it. Um, but for people to achieve the basics in life, you know, you want to be able to pay the bills. You want to do food shopping. You want a holiday if you can. But also, you've got to remember, I'd like a mortgage, or I'd like I'd like to get married, or I'd like to be in a relationship. I'd like all that. I'd like to have a car. I'd like to have a, an electric bike, whatever you want. These things all cost money. And that is where the, the exodus happens because the companies are not paying the wages because we can replace a whole load of people to do those other jobs with more people doing the same. So that higher skill set that, that you then develop, it drives up a wage. It means you can do things. That does start a little bit of a merry-go-round. So you will see someone who's got quite a top job in one collection you don't hear for them for a little while and then they pop up in another collection and then someone else pops up there and you have this big swap round because everybody is taking that skill and talent and just offering that little bit more of a challenge or a little bit more of a, a funding package or a support package now what i would say is not all doom and gloom obviously it's a bit like you know not so many years ago that, that this place you didn't have running water in sections or toilets and everybody's working six days a week. And but thankfully life is changing. There is an understanding that, you know, if you invest in your teams, you get even better results out. You get good retention, but you get a great delivery for your, for your animals. Uh, and that welfare and care goes up. The wages haven't gone up uh, hugely. What we've managed to do here is we've managed to secure different levels. And so, Rather than having fixed term contracts, you, we now have more permanent contracts, which is great. And of those permanent contracts, we've managed to increase the hours on those. So you know what you're going to get at the end of the year, you're going to get a salary. And, and I think for most animal keepers starting off, it's never about the money. It's about the, the career and the passion and, and the involvement. But as reality hits, and I think you said the figure there, you know, uh, late 20s, early 30s, life changes. You have some all grown-up stuff to start thinking about. Costs money. That's where the positions become a bit more tight. And sometimes people do leave the industry to go and do things elsewhere. And the skill set that you've got, by the way, is, is, is keepers. And as you go up the ladder, it's never undersell it. It's a massive skill set. You know, I'm really proud of anybody that can engage with a guest or, or can drive a tractor or use a chainsaw or can do a, a, a Species 360 Zim sheet or whatever. You know, that knowledge, that computer-based stuff, or, or, they're all skills. Not everybody has them. And as an animal keeper, you gain this massive collection of, of talents that actually are very useful outside. I think my aim and my mission is would be to say we just need to keep getting it better for keepers. We need to make the market more more secure. And, and I use the phrase dead man's shoes because once you get people in a, a role that they're happy with and they are good, nobody wants to move. That's not necessarily a bad thing, you know. But you will notice uh, as you travel around this country, if you visit lots of collections, um, I mean, there are long lit keepers all over. I'm slowly taking over the world, I think, because we've not been able to keep them here uh, because we can't offer them the long-term permanent and the salary increase because we don't have all those positions. So people, quite rightly, pack up their bag and they go off somewhere else and they pop up and they do very, very well because they found a position that did have more progression or a higher financial package. And you'd think I'd be sad about that because I've lost some incredible people some absolutely stunning keepers out there and uh, and I wish I could keep them all. But James, I'd never hold any of them back. I try to convince them the grass isn't greener, but actually if it's finance or if it's career progression, you can't get it here. You'd be wrong to, to hold them back. You know, they go with my blessing and, and um, God bless them and I hope they have a great career 
and then when they are 40 or 50 and they've got all that extra skill and they've got their their house or whatever they'll come back to me uh um you know we'll get even better then some cracking answers there darren and really insightful so thank you so much for sharing that now you'll be happy to know you've conquered the big questions we now move on to the final part of this podcast which leads us to the quick questions it should fly through but we'll see how it goes it could very much explode into conversation but we'll play it one at a time so to kick us off then darren number one your favorite animal <laughs> oh crikey i'm asked that a lot uh so quick fire my favourite animal is the latest animal in the collection. I love learning about them. I love whatever the animal has joined, the more I can learn and I can get in, engaged in. So the latest animal in the collection, you know, I love shalom, I love tortoises, I love parrots of all shapes, sizes. Oh my goodness, it would be unfair to, to pick animals, you know. My specialisms, you know, obviously come to the forefront. I like the latest animal. I love learning. Every day should be a school day. Always remember that. So currently, what's our latest animals? sloth i love them i'm learning lots about them and i would suggest my favorite animal is the latest animal in the park great answer okay number two then what is the best side of the industry other guys and girls that are out there in the in the zoo world might have a a different answer Mine might be a bit of a disappointment because it's not about saving the rarest animal on the planet it is not about learning all the science and the dna and the genetics my favorite bit is sharing my passion with other people many years ago we were asked to start filming the animal park series at, at longleat and of course as peasants we all revolted you know what do you want a film crew stuck in your face for all the time i was uh, in the old pets corner and i had a snake and a barn owl uh, that i used to use for presentations and I stood there uh, and I was surrounded by maybe a dozen people, 12 people uh, with my barn owl. And we did the whole talk and did the flying and all great. And I talk about all the conservation and the barb feather. Everything was brilliant. I put the barn away, washed up, come out an hour later. I did the snake, really exactly the same thing, engagement and see the, the, the kids' faces and, and the adults' faces. I suddenly realized that doing that to a dozen people, then I get a camera stuck in me chops. Viewing figures for Animal Park now are in excess of a million per show. 9.15 in the morning, a million people watching telly, James. That's a million people to share what I love about the animals here. And, you know, there's so many good things, so many sad things. There's so many dramas that we live. It's what happens. And so I think what I love about the industry is that we... We are ambassadors. We are we are the salesmen for nature, uh, and to share what we love and to give someone that that magical memory moment, either through looking at an animal or hearing about it. That's what I love about the industry. Still, yeah, spot on. Okay, next one. Then, what would you improve within the industry? I think there is a lot of growth in the industry. I think there's a lot of different opinions in which direction uh, animal conservation should go and animal representation. I would say what we need to change most is agree that not everybody has the right answer. So, what one hat does not fit all. And you might be a tiny little farm park somewhere and the kids are coming out to learn about cows or chickens or whatever it's going to be. That is equally as correct and right for a zoo as releasing animals back into the wild on re-release programs. And I would say as well that the bit that we've got to get better at is understanding that tomorrow is another day. The way science is moving just with the genetics and the DNA or we used to have to search sex parrots you'd knock them out you'd make an incision you'd go in with an endoscope but by the way didn't have endoscopes for a long time but you go in you'd have a little look uh you'd say boy girl you risk sedating your precious parrot to know whether it's a boy or a girl you now get it off a bit of flaky feather scalp whatever it is you know uh scurf. embrace science understand uh, uh, uh and i actually think we've got to do that better We've got to use science more. And also, uh, there's a, a huge groundswell to enrichment and training and behavior understanding, you know, managing your animals in a hands-off manner. I agree there is absolutely a role for that. It should not override the other role of good stockmen knowing how to handle restrain move animals and when to change pasture when to change food so it's that balance take science take new thinking but do not 
do not lose the experience that that is out there as well yeah some really insightful stuff once again darren thank you so much for that one now our next one then this is quite a large question who's your idol within the industry oh it depends who's gonna listen to this i can't say that i think my, my idols are yes everybody's normal top ratings obviously the Edinburgh, the Dr. Jane Goodall. I remember Desmond Morris. I remember Johnny Morris as a TV celebrity, really. You know, those people are my idols because of the amazing impact they've had on me, on my life growing up and, and what they've they've left their mark and still carry on leaving their, their mark. But I would say equally, I mentioned earlier that uh, Reg Bloom and his family who gave me that chance, Francis Rendell, Keith Harris, who was the head warden here when I when I first came here amazing people that have uh, are my idols because they've given me opportunities to to do the thing that I love the most and I'd be wrong if I said I left out Durrells and the the David Taylor vets and all those people that we're aware of and I hope it doesn't sound too cheesy the people I think I adore and I respect the most James to embarrass you are people like you are people that come up to me and say and it's embarrassing because they come up to me and say, oh, when I was a baby and little, I used to watch Animal Park. You know, there's an adult opposite, opposite me now. It's those people, my idols, because they've been engaged and inspired and are going on to save a species, save the planet, become a politician, change the law, invent something. They're my idols, James. Those, those people that love what we do and they're doing it for themselves. A great answer with some really kind and lovely words there, Darren. So thank you so much for that one. Now... I leave you with this question. It's probably one of the hardest for the whole podcast. So we'll see how we get on, Darren. But I want you now to sum up the whole industry in only three words. Oh, changing. Got two left, haven't I? Engaging. Essential. Changing. Engaging. Essential. That's the industry that I, I work in. We work in. I think I think if you give me another three words, I could probably think of three more. But I, I'll stick with those. Uh, we are changing. We have got to be engaging and we are and will be for a long time essential uh, for us to, to, to carry on doing the good things we're doing. Very well put. And I think a really nice way to conclude this podcast. I can't stress enough, Darren. Thank you so, so much for coming on and kicking us off. This first episode complete. Thank you so, so much. James, thank you for, for inviting me in. And I, I know I talk a lot. Um, I am still passionate. I'm more round. I've lost my more hair. I've had worries, but actually i still do throw that duvet off most mornings and want to come to work so i hope everybody out there listening feels the same and, and thanks for inviting me on mate thank you no thank you for being such an amazing guest and hopefully we'll get you on again very very soon Cheers. bye and that concludes this week's episode what an amazing guest and an amazing time we had now if you have enjoyed it please do subscribe on instagram facebook or our podcast channels to zookeeping 101 I can't express how thankful I am personally from a fellow zookeeper to have you along for this quite amazing journey learning about everything zookeeper. Otherwise, please subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you very, very soon. Bye.